Hey everyone, today I want to talk about Singing in the Rain from 1952 by Gene Kelly and Stanley Donnan. This is the 51st episode of my Thousand Favorite Movie series, where I talk about the movies I love the most in a random order. When I was a kid, sometimes my dad would like to sing these old-fashioned songs for us in a joking way. Most of the time, we thought he was just making them up, but they were all real, just old so we'd never heard of them. Well, when it rained outside, he would always sing Singing in the Rain, which is my favorite of the songs that he would jokingly sing. I would always say that he's making it up, but he would say that he wasn't. Little did I know at the time that it was not only real, but it was actually the title of the most famous and most cherished musical of Hollywood's golden era. In fact, it's without a doubt one of the most classic movies ever made, featuring one of the most famous shots in history and one famous musical scene after another. A crowd pleaser if there ever was one, this is an older movie that anyone today can reliably enjoy. One that can, and has, served as a gateway for newer generations to get into a bygone era of movies, myself included. Besides The Wizard of Oz, I'm pretty sure this was my first pre-1960s musical. In sheer exuberance and energy, its lightheartedness and joyfulness made me want to come back for more. This makes it, in my experience, a popular staple at any film school, which is understandable not just for its greatness, but for the fact that it's about movies, the history of movies, and the art of movie making. In fact, one can argue that it's something of a cumulative text, offering a celebration of the state of cinema, especially musicals, up until that point. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The story's kind of a twist on the old standby, the backstage musical, where instead of it being about the making of a play, it's about the making of a movie. It stars Gene Kelly as Don Lockwood, half of the popular Lockwood and Lamont silent movie acting duo. Everything's going great, but while making their next movie, The Dueling Cavalier, the jazz singer releases, killing the silent era and ushering in the sound era overnight. This forces the Lockwood and Lamont duo to adapt to sound, which doesn't exactly go smoothly, and the film extracts a huge amount of laughs at the expense of this failing. Meanwhile, Lockwood meets a fan of his called Kathy Selden, played by Debbie Reynolds. Their relationship starts off weird. They met by him literally jumping into her car as she's driving, and she degrades his profession as a movie actor, which makes him a little self-conscious and down. But of course it doesn't take long until they fall in love. Out of these two sort of parallel story threads, the story concerning the movie and the love story, the love story clearly gets a short end of the stick, as it seems fairly standard in comparison. However, I do enjoy how it starts, with Kathy sort of upsetting Don's world before they meet again and are honest with each other. At first, she pretends that she's a stage actor and that she's above him, but very shortly after, is shown to not be a dignified stage actor, but rather an ordinary chorus girl. This produces interesting feelings in Don, where he starts to doubt his profession because of her, yet perhaps it's his glimpse at her true self that intrigues him and makes him fall in love. It's an interesting psychological state that he's in at this point of the film, which makes the scene when his friend played by Donald O'Connor tries to cheer him up in the Make Him Laugh number more impactful. And speaking of laughing, since this is typically thought of as one of the great musicals, I think the fact that this is also one of the great comedies gets overlooked. And so it was a pleasure when I saw this in film school with an audience full of students to hear everyone laugh so consistently. It's funny not just because of a few one-liners, although it has some famous and memorable ones, like when Lena Lamont angrily explains, I can't make love to a bush, or I make more money than, than, than Calvin Coolidge put together. But it has loads of well-developed gags that pay off really well. One of the most genius gags, I think, is a gag that you actually don't know is happening until the punchline. At the beginning, it builds up the wonderful acting duo of Lockwood and Lamont through the radio announcers, the many adoring fans, and a series of flashbacks showing their origins. But through this whole opening section, the movie's very careful not to have Lamont speak, even when having a conversation with Lockwood in one of their flashbacks. Well, we get to see one of their movies premiere, them taking a bow on stage, and then backstage, after 13 minutes into the film, she finally speaks, revealing her over-the-top screech of a voice. I love the patience the movie has to delay the comic reveal, which one can't fully appreciate until his second viewing. Lamont, played by Gene Hagen, is also brilliant in the scenes revolving around the shooting of the movie, maybe the funniest in the movie. As I implied before, the focus on how movies are made is the most interesting part of the movie, because it's not only humorous, but also informative. While they're making The Dueling Cavalier as a silent film, the duo have to do a seductive love scene, even though the actors themselves are fighting. Because it's silent and their voices aren't being recorded, they could say anything they want, and so they're free to insult each other, with Aqua calling Lamont a reptile as he's kissing her hand. It's a wonderfully rich scene for being a funny situation, while also giving us an insight into how movies used to be made. 
Who knows if this kind of thing actually happened in real life. Later, they shoot basically the same scene again with sound added, so now they have to be careful about what they say and how they say it. Instead of the dialogue that's written for him, Lockwood just wants to say what he always does, I love you, I love you, I love you, and the director's flippantly okay with it, which shows how both the actor and director stubbornly stick to their old, outdated ways, which leads to hilarious results at the movie's preview, where it plays ridiculously and teenagers mock it as they leave the theater. But recording the dialogue in the first place isn't easy, especially for Lamont, who just can't seem to find the microphone, so they try various microphone positions, each causing different problems. I'm just glad there's someone else who's as frustrated with the sound recording as I am. During the ill-fated preview, we realized that it wasn't just Lamont who they couldn't record properly, but Lockwood as well, as we can barely hear him over the rustling of the microphone in his clothes. As if that wasn't enough, the sound and picture suddenly go out of sync, a technical problem that couldn't have existed in the silent era. All these problems add up in a hilarious way, but what makes this again so valuable is that it gives us an insight into the very real trouble that studios and actors had adapting to sound, as well as how movies are made in general. Maybe that's why this produced the most laughter of the movie when I saw this in film school. The humor also shines through in many of the film's many musical numbers. When it comes right down to it, these are what the movie's best known for. Famously, most of the songs were not written for the movie, but were actually songs featured in previous ones from the 30s and late 20s, the actual early sound era. Only two songs are original, and perhaps coincidentally, they're the two funniest. One of them is Moses Supposes, which is fairly lightweight and doesn't add much to the movie, except for good dancing and the final, eh. The other one though, Make Him Laugh, is easily one of the most memorable from the film. I'd probably place it at number two. The song's catchy, but it's obviously Donald O'Connor's milestone performance that makes it one of the most legendary of Hollywood musical numbers. When you think of the great movie Dances, you instantly think of the elegance and grace of Astaire Rogers, as well as Gene Kelly, among others. But O'Connor throws elegance out of the window here. He uses very few traditional dance steps, and instead employs silly yet difficult jumps and a thing where he runs on his knees, expert prop work, two running backflips, funny faces, and basically just throwing himself all over the place, for lack of a better word. There are subtle moments as well, like when he gets hit on the back of the head with a piece of wood, but his reaction is delayed by a second, and that always makes me smile. It's like he and the filmmakers are just trying everything they can to make you laugh, and it definitely works. Beyond that, I mentioned before how Singing in the Rain plays like a kind of cumulative text on the state of musicals up until this point, and this is because of just how many popular old songs were updated and given new context. Some, like Good Morning, Broadway Melody, and of course Singing in the Rain, among others, were redone in their entirety and have replaced the originals as the most famous renditions, while others are paid tribute to in very small ways, like in the colorful montage showing very brief snippets of some songs edited together and building to almost like a remix of all of them put together. The movie also shows various styles of musical numbers that were popular in Hollywood history, such as the vaudeville act, the acrobatic showcase, the humorous interlude, the love ballad, the ballet, which is part of another tradition, the 10 plus minute long fantasy set piece, the Busby Berkeley style overhead shot, the one where a pseudo man with a top hat and cane sings with the line of Ziegfeld Folly Girls, for example. So as you can imagine, this has a lot more numbers than most musicals do, and they're woven beautifully into the narrative. The biggest exception, and perhaps the only striking flaw in the movie for me, is the beautiful girl scene, which shows that top hat and cane number. It's an iconic type of number, so I don't blame them for including it, but I think it's taken too seriously and takes too much time, especially when they show no less than 12 different fashions in a row, which brings the movie dead to a halt. But other than that, and perhaps Moses supposes, it all flows together very organically. Now I'll talk about my favorite moments. Right off the top, I've got to talk about the Sing in the Rain number, possibly the most iconic musical number ever filmed. It works on so many levels, one of them being the context, it comes at a time where Lockwood is very happy. He has hope for the future of his movie, as well as great love for Kathy. And the scene that follows is all about him expressing his happiness, which Gene Kelly makes magical. Despite what should be a depressing atmosphere, his smile and dancing fill up the screen with joy, like a ray of sunshine after a storm. The sequence starts off simply, but then gradually builds energy as it continues, as he accepts a downpour from a water pipe, kicks the water puddles, and finally energetically jumps and splashes in the big puddles on the street. His joy in the pouring rain, not caring about soaking himself in the face of his happiness, makes this as impactful as it is famous. There's also the big production near the end of the film called The Broadway Melody, 
In the tradition of earlier movies, like The Red Shoes, and more crucially, in American in Paris the year before, this is a long, fantastical number that shows off great dancing and production design in a kind of alternate reality. In this case, it's going to be part of the movie they're making. There are several standout moments, including Gene Kelly's big grin at the end, and his mouth during this brief scene. Pay attention to it, it's just hilarious. But the highlight is Sid Charisse, the great dancer-actress, turning up. It's fun to see her personality and sexiness dominate Kelly, becoming a powerful force that equals him. And later, in one of my favorite shots of the movie, there's this huge open space where she performs ballet with a dress that's as long as a football field, blowing in the wind. Next, I've already mentioned the funny stuff having to do with the trouble they're having making the movie. That stuff is all great, including the cut from when the studio chief says excitedly, Lamont and Lockwood, they talk, to Lamont saying, Well, of course we talk, don't everybody? Which reminds them that it won't be as easy as all that. Finally, speaking of Lamont talking, I love the sequence where Kathy is dubbing her. Similar to the scenes I mentioned before, it shows how an entire process is done. First with Kathy singing, then with Lamont learning to lip sync to that singing, then the shooting of the scene, then a beautiful and seamless transition into black and white on the screen. This is how art gets made. By the way, it's worth noting not only that Debbie Reynolds' singing voice was indeed dubbed, making three layers of dubbing, but in the ultimate irony, in the scene where Reynolds is dubbing Gene Hagen's speaking voice, Hagen herself is actually dubbing Reynolds, dubbing her. Gene Hagen's voice isn't actually like the one in Singing in the Rain. If you want a good example of her real voice from another great movie, watch The Asphalt Jungle. But to be honest, her performance is so memorable in Singing in the Rain that it's nearly impossible for me to hear her real voice in another movie and totally accept it. But in the end, what I love about Singing in the Rain is that it's one of those movies where, even though you know everything that's coming, it still manages to delight. It's a movie with no pretensions whatsoever, that still manages to practically sum up Hollywood's young history until that point. When looked at it from that perspective, it's a celebration of the spirit of movies that still feels essential. It's one of my 1,000 favorite movies. Thanks for watching my video! Have you seen Singing in the Rain? Let me know what you think in the comments. I think of all my favorite movies as my friends, and I think of my audience as friends too. Remember, I upload a new video every other Friday, so if you want to help me complete this thousand favorite movies epic, don't forget to like and subscribe.